Okay, so the Dhammapada. This is um, example number one. These are sort of like Clash of the Titans. Rawr, rawr. <laughs> they're not exactly in opposition to each other, but they're two takes on the same subject. Different flavor, different tone. So on the section called Craving, this is just a little taste. The craving of a person who lives negligently spreads like a creeping vine. Such a person leaps ever onward, like a monkey seeking fruit in the forest. Sorrow grows like grass after rain for anyone overcome by this miserable craving and clinging to the world. It goes along and along, <laughs> like this. Um, sorrow falls away like drops of water from a lotus for anyone who overcomes this miserable craving and clinging to the world. Setting up this dichotomy, seemingly, apparently, of good and bad, of right and wrong, a morality there, you know, of, you know, you're either a sinner or you're not a sinner. Which side are you on? That's one impression you might have reading this. Um, as I was reading through it, I read through the whole thing yesterday, I started thinking about Isan. Here we are in Isanji. And I, I don't know if many of you people here have a connection with Hartford Street Zen Center. And maybe some people knew Isan. Um, I didn't know him. And I've heard stories and I have impressions of him. And one of the impressions I have is a kind-hearted person. Um, he was work leader at Zen Center and he was just known for being so welcoming of anybody. And he's been kind of... Uh, a role model for me of just meeting people, you know, wherever they're at. And he's also a role model because he, he seemed to have lived a very rich, full, complicated, messy life. It was not so clear that he was entirely good. You know, he was not a cookie cutter type priest. You know, he was a priest. He was a Zen priest. And I really respect this. This is a very important example for us of someone who has devoted his life to living in vow, even though it may not look like that all the time. Um, and I was thinking about the four bodhisattva vows as I was reading this, and I was thinking of Isan, who inspired many people. You know, the four bodhisattva vows, beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible, but I still vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, but I'm going to enter them. And Buddha's way is like unsurpassable. You can't surpass it, but I vow to become it. This, this is, um, there's something about this that is, it, it's deeply moving. Just because it's impossible doesn't mean you don't make the effort. I mean, duh. You know, this is what I'm sure you're all already aware of. But I, for one, need to be reminded of this, and it was a connection I made with this, just because I'm still, you know, just because I'm a monkey seeking fruit in the forest, leaping all over the place, it doesn't, my craving doesn't make me a bad person. My craving doesn't make me a loser. It doesn't make me a non-practitioner. It makes me a person who precisely um, sees the problem here. <laughs> And that there's work to do, and that I need help, and this is why I'm here. So this is the compassion of the Buddha of not, and this is where I feel like it's, it's very tender, you know, to keep encouraging ourselves, to remind ourselves that it's not, when we read these things, it's not a competitive thing. It's not pitting ourselves against something that excludes us, we're not good enough, we don't belong to the sacred. It's just that this is, this is, um, it's an opportunity, it's a reason. If we weren't in, our, in the midst of our craving all the time, why would we practice? What would the need be to practice? So, um, I'm interested in this. I feel like going back to that word hope, like hope for any of us, I feel, is a willingness, has to be connected with a willingness to dive right into our darkness, to actually use our darkness as a means to uh, transform ourselves. And personally, I feel that when I'm willing to dive into my darkness, 
that's precisely where I'm going to inspire people. You know, this, it's not about looking in the mirror unflinchingly. <laughs> it's looking in the mirror flinchingly. <laughs> and being with all the other flinching beings. You know, here we are. You know, and talking about going back to see family. Man, if I, that's a great practice to do. If you've been at Tussle Heart for six years and you think you're getting somewhere, <laughs> just go visit the family, you know. My mother, she's so great. She's like, how long have you been practicing? <laughs> and you still get angry? You know? <laughs> I, I'd only been at Tessa Hart for like two years, and she was like, I know you love it there, honey, but when do you graduate? <laughs> These are very important questions. <laughs> okay, so, anyway, so now the other, this other book, um, Stephen Batchelor, where Verses from the Center, it's about the teachings of the Middle Way, Nagarjuna, the emptiness teachings. And this can be like, oh God, get away from me, emptiness, no. <laughs> I don't understand any of that, I don't want to, I just want to continue with my life and be a nice person. <laughs> I mean, what I'm trying to get at is it can be kind of maybe a little intimidating. But you brought it up, that you do want to, and I think we all do, I do, you know, I don't want to just get by on my charm and personality alone, I mean, I want to actually study. Well, so far. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Cohen, who ordained me, I mean, maybe some people know her, she's really wonderful, and when she describes the teachings of uh, the middle way of, you know, like when you think of the middle way, do you think it's about like the average? Are we talking about the <laughs> average between two points? She says, you know, she calls it like some people misinterpret it as, you know, it's like the beige of Buddhism. <laughs> some safe middle ground where no one's offended, you know, the middle point between two extremes where you can sort of squeak by and not offend anybody. That's not what we're talking about. 